Okay, good morning, hi. Um, I'm David Millman, um, I'm from New York University. Um, I think this microphone doesn't work. I will just talk louder. Can you hear now? Yes. Sorry, I, it's, there's something making, oh, there's an air thing in the middle. <clears throat> so hi, I'm David Millman. I'm here with Rick Gilmore and Dylan Simon um, to talk about the Databury project. Uh, Databury is a digital library for sharing video. Uh, our current focus is in the behavioral sciences and, and our current focus is on a national scale size library. Uh, we've had inquiries from other disciplines and we've had inquiries from international colleagues uh, because a lot of the infrastructure for, for doing this kind of data sharing is, is, uh, applies in other settings and you'll see that a lot of the infrastructure for the policy and process also applies in other settings so we're, we, we're not sure where this might lead us. Um, I'm, so I'm going to talk for a minute or two just to give you a broad outline and then I'm going to turn it over to, to Rick to talk about uh, how we're implementing the data sharing process and the protocol and then Dylan will walk us through the, the data model uh, which is pretty flexible and it'll show you how we're organizing a, a collection that varies really widely. Uh, we're not quite open for business yet so just a word on our status. We will. We plan to have the first release uh, available in February, so we're almost open for business, a couple of months. Uh, and we have a number of contributors who are already lined up and ready to deposit materials, so we're, we're almost launched. Uh, we're small, there are only a few of us uh, on the team so far, uh, but I want to recognize a couple of people. First, uh, the principal investigator of the project is Karen Adolf, a professor of psychology at NYU. Um, and I'd also like to recognize Lisa Steiger, uh, the project coordinator. Karen can't be with us today, but Lisa is here. Can you wave? Hi. And um, Lisa will probably bail us out within the next 30 or 40 minutes. Um, um, so these are the, the high level goals of the project. Uh, and today we're going to focus especially on the first one. Uh, the repository building, and also the, the uh, fourth one about the policies that enable data sharing. Um, th that's, that's a fair bit of material, and we want to leave time for questions, so, so we'll see if, you know, where we are when we get through those, and then maybe we can backtrack and talk about the other stuff, too. These, the, I, we're showing you all of these goals because these were actually the outline of our um, our funding proposals. So we are funded by uh, the National Science Foundation and also by NIH. Um, the oldest of those is the NSF uh, award and that's a little more than a year old, about 14 months, something like that. Um, so what we're what our intentions are, uh, are not going to be surprising to you all, uh, um, but I want to emphasize that, that um, just a couple of points about it. Um, we're about sharing and not just about compliance. So there are a lot of these kind of repositories where if you deposit there, you're compliant with the NIH guidelines and then you can move along. But those, those repositories don't necessarily encourage or, or find themselves easily shared. And we're all about that. So we're thinking about the use cases, what kinds of things people are, would be able to do with, this, with, with our collections, and we really want people to use it. Um, the other thing I want to emphasize about these use cases is they, they, a lot of them come back to haunt us as um, uh, consent agreements, policy, uh, and release kinds of language, because these are all or most of this is about what kind of things you can do with it and therefore about what kinds of permissions we're going to need to get from people to be able to do that. Um, uh, we're, there's a, a bunch of these kind of trade-offs. Uh, every time we enable something new, uh, we find that there are implicit challenges that are implied by doing the something new. So just a couple of them. Uh, one thing that's really neat about these collections is that uh, the data is video and, and it's people participating in experiments and so you, can, you don't have to do anything with the data to use it in another domain. 
um, just, which is just common sense, but that's not the case in a lot of other research data sets. So for instance, if, you're, if a researcher is collecting a video for um, uh, motion studies, then somebody who's doing language research can use that same video immediately without doing anything to it. They're just interested in a different aspect of it. You don't have to recode anything. You don't have to you know, touch it at all. Um, the, the other, the, you know, the, the flip side of that is that this data is pretty identifiable too. You know, for the same reason, it's video, so you know, it's, um, it's, you, it's very hard to de-identify or anonymize anything. It's pictures of people, and so you can tell who they are. Um, another, another challenge and opportunity at the same time is that, that it's the, the structure of data varies really widely because researchers in this field and researchers in most fields uh, have really different ways of organizing their material and it sort of depends on their, the purpose of their original research. That's uh, um, immediately in, you know, in contrast to trying to create a consistent metadata schema so that people who want to consume material can find it easily. So we find ourselves walking that line all the time too. Um, another another double-edged sword is that we're trying to encourage open data sharing, but how open can it be when we have all of these privacy issues around it? And so um, Rick is going to talk in, in much more depth about what what we need to put in place so that we can encourage the appropriate level of sharing. Um, we're getting into different kinds of territories with our institutional review boards, for instance, and, and um, uh, you know, sponsored programs offices, and in a way that they're not used to doing business with us, uh, whereas uh, the project otherwise relies on infrastructure in, in ways that are probably more familiar. It uses a lot of central IT. It uses a lot of the library for things like metadata management and preservation. Uh, but it also is, is in touch with you know, the, the IRB, with the sponsored projects office, and with university council to a much greater extent than this kind of project you know, would normally do. So I'm just going to stop there, and, and you'll, Rick and, and Dylan will give you much more depth on the rest of it. So Rick's going to talk about how we're, we're enabling the sharing through policies and permissions. While we're in transition, are, are there any uh, preliminary questions that came up through David's section? No? All right. So what we're, our, our task is to create a, uh, a set of relationships that uh, allow Databury to share identifiable data uh, in a way that preserves the promises given to research participants to protect their uh, privacy. So. That seems like a pretty tough nut to crack, and it was one of the nuts that we, that we knew we were going to have to crack for this to work. So before I tell you how we, have, how we think that's going to work, let me tell you how, or, or, or refresh your memory about how research with human participants now proceeds in a typical context. So in a typical context, um, there are relationships between an investigator and an institution. Right, that are bound together by an IRB protocol and ethics certification. So all researchers who conduct human participants research uh, have to uh, demonstrate ethics training. That training is supervised or provided by uh, uh, an ethics board or an institutional review board. Uh, and then when an investigator uh, chooses to conduct research, which has a specific, uh, specific definition, uh, an application is made to an institutional review board and approval sought. There are situations where approval is waived or different levels of approval. But there are, are formal relationships that bind an institution and an investigator together in order to make sure that research is carried out in a way that is ethical and does not harm human participants. Of course, the other side of this equation are the people who are participating in a variety of research studies. And uh, the fundamental notion there is one of informed consent. Uh, so how many of you have participated in a research study that involves informed consent procedures? OK. I think several, many people have. Not, not all have. In our case, many of our cases in, in my laboratory and in Karen's laboratory, other laboratories, what's involved is actually bringing children, in my case and Karen's case, babies, um, and their parents or caregivers into the laboratory. Uh, and in that situation, uh, parents or guardians give consent for their minor children. Uh, so that informed consent, the notion of, of informed participation in research, um, comes along with it a, a promise of confidentiality. 
So I promise to research participants that I will not reveal their identities, in, uh, even if their, the research study involves nothing harmful at all. So that, those important promises are part of what we have to find a way to maintain as we move forward with data sharing. And you might think, well, th that seems to be antithetical to the notion of sharing. So, uh, but in fact, we think it's not. So here comes Databury. We're the new kids on the block. Um, how do we change the situation? And again, our, our insight was rather than to reinvent wheel, a wheel of any sort, but was rather to build upon the existing infrastructure and strengthen it. So our innovations, our, our notion is to uh, ask participants who are engaged in research whether they give permission for their session that's been recorded to be shared. Very simple extension of the notion of informed consent. Uh, and many of our colleagues in our field actually ask research participants now whether the recorded session can be shared in educational scientific context with others for illustrative purposes. So there's already a, f a foundation and framework, a framework for that that uh, exists. Then we couple that with an institutional agreement, uh, or an investigator agreement, excuse me, between uh, the institution and the investigator and Databrain. I'll have more to say about that. And that enables uh, that research protocol's information to be shared with Databrain. So when a new investigator arrives and wants access to Databrain's resources, all that new investigator will need to demonstrate is that they also have ethics certification, that they're with an institution that is supervising their activities, they have to promise to treat the data ethically to maintain uh, confidentiality of the research participants, um, and uh, sign uh, an agreement that binds them to Databrain in that way. And this is for, uh, we envision this in the context of a situation where one of the use cases, say, that David uh, suggested, say that, uh, that uh, a hot new study comes across uh, your email yesterday uh, about uh, babies understand uh, social relationships in a way that, they, that we didn't think they did before. And you'd like to see the result yourself. Uh, so, if, if there, perhaps the, the finding was published in a, an outlet that allows supplemental material, but supplemental materials are often limited. What if the full data set, the full videos and coded videos were actually available on Databrary? Um, as an investigator, I could go on and look at the videos and decide for myself whether I believe the finding or not. Perhaps I could even um, uh, look at the methods and, and, and evaluate them critically. That's not really research. Right? It's, sort of, it's what many institutional review boards think of as pre-research, or it's scientific activity, nonetheless must be carried out in an ethical way that respects the privacy of participants, uh, but it's not exactly research, and therefore may not require uh, a formal research protocol. And our belief is that many use cases for data brewery will not involve research. They'll involve pre-research activities, scientific activities that, that may not require institutional review board approval. Now, of course, IRBs were designed to be the local uh, review of research activities in the diverse set of communities in, in our country. And so IRB standards vary somewhat. So what NYU allows Karen, Dillon, um, Lisa, and David to do may be different from what Penn State would permit me to do. But we think that, that for, in many situations, access to, uh, to database uh, sensitive resources can be limited to those individuals who have this sort of uh, ethics certification and not require B certification. However, when the activity that the investigator wants, uh, chooses to do uh, involves research, the next step would be to seek approval from an IRB, and that would be the arrangement and the relationship between the investigator and data brewery would already be established. So just to review for you, again, our, our innovations or insights here were, and perhaps insight is too strong, because what we're essentially doing is building upon the existing infrastructure, is to seek permission to share from people who are depicted in recordings, which extends the idea of informed consent, and restrict access uh, to uh, recordings that have, for which those individuals depicted have given permission. That includes authorized researchers who have ethics training and researchers who agree to maintain privacy. Now there will be, um, uh, in, 
we, 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 I'll say shortly, there will be aspects of the database that will be open to the public, uh, but that, that requires its own range of sharing. So how do we enable this process? Well, the first, the first um, mechanism is to create template language that other investigators can adopt, and add to their existing research uh, schemes uh, that embodies these principles. And so we've created uh, template documents and they're on our, uh, our website and also we have a GitHub repository which I will give the URL for here shortly. The template, and we won't go through it line by line, uh, but essentially it, it uh, points out to the research participants that, sh that permission to share is not the same as participating research. Uh, that was important for, for our research community uh, who was concerned that asking participants to do one more thing might in fact be the straw that broke the camel's back and make them refuse to participate. Talk about data privacy concerns, who has access, how long. Our goal is to store the information indefinitely and that actually poses a challenge for some researchers in the sense that uh, even, if, for example, my own protocol that I've modified recently uh, has a data destruction clause. I'm, I'm, I've uh, promised to destroy uh, recordings after five years of, uh, beyond the project deadline. And many IRBs encourage people to destroy data, which of course is antithetical to, to the goals of this project. That there's no compensation. There are special provisions for having assent from minors and describing different levels of sharing. So here are the levels of sharing that we're asking people to, to agree to. The first would be none, right? So no sharing has to go forward. And that, that permission, that particular level of permission, as with all of them, has to be then maintained with those records uh, throughout the lifetime of the, of the information. Shared, but again, our, the sh shared data would be shared only with authorized researchers who've met those ethics and other criteria. These are individuals known to Databrary. Their identities are known. There's you know, no anonymous uh, identities within the system. So it's, a, it's not YouTube or Reddit or Tumblr. Um, there's another level of sharing which is excerptable. And what that means is that individuals can give permission to share videos and they may also give permission for sections of those videos, what we're calling excerpts, to be created and shown by authorized researchers to the public. So this would be, uh, allow in the right circumstance for uh, the, the use case that I mentioned before. Perhaps a video that, uh, uh, that illustrates a given finding might be associated with a, the, the, public, the, the publication of a particular uh, paper and so forth, or uh, may, not be a, may not be particularly notable, but one that uh, illustrates the range of findings. And then finally, there's an open level of sharing, which would be uh, sharing with the public. Uh, that we at least contemplate as being something uh, we will support, although we, we're not certain how, how far that will go. All right, we need to record those levels of permission accurately. Right now, this is a heavily paper-based system in laboratories. So there are paper consent forms, there are paper video release forms, and so forth. Um, so we've spent a lot of time developing a template form that records very clearly what those permissions are on paper. Um, and that includes, and this is different from a research study, it includes anyone depicted in a recording. And that's important because so, some of our colleagues record in natural settings, home settings, where the focus might be the infant or child, but in fact other individuals are depicted incidentally, and their permission must be sought as well. And in order to share, we need to essentially follow the lowest common denominator. If, if any one of those, those individuals depicted says no, we have to follow that, uh, that, that uh, choice. Explicit yes, no boxes and differences for minors and adults are part of our system. We have to get this right. Getting permissions right is fundamental to the enterprise. And so we're in the process of planning and we'll be moving very quickly to a system that re electronically records permissions. Um, that's specifically linked to session of participant level metadata. And we think this is critical for avoiding data entry errors. And some of these uh, cautions have come from our initial efforts to curate some data sets uh, at NYU. We realized how easy it is for a permission to be, uh, to be recorded inaccurately. Now, of course, our default will be none, but we need, to, uh, we need to get this right. And so we think that an electronic system is on the, on the road map to, uh, to doing so. 
possibly through some sort of spreadsheet template, uh, possibly something slightly more sophisticated as a web-based permission system. This is uh, a small part of what, we're, what we think is going to become an increasingly important aspect of the project, and that is uh, a, a system or set of systems for laboratory data management that, uh, and, and the self-curation of scientific data that will make it possible and easier for researchers to share. We, we're, the, the more we go, uh, we, the more we build on the library, the more we realize how important it's going to be to have those uh, scientific products organized from the very beginning in a way that uh, would enable them to be shared. So we think that this system is better, and I want to say why we think it's a little it's better. We think it's better than the existing video releases because the language about the level of risk is clear and unambiguous. We make it clear that the consent to participate in the research is different from the permission to share data. Sometimes those are commingled in others in other contexts. We think it's easier for participants. Uh, we think that we that we communicate. Uh, a more realistic conceptualization of risk and that we standardize uh, this across contributors via templates. And I should say uh, the uh, realistic conceptualization of risk stems from our realization that um, many individuals these days in scientific or educational settings carry with them a digital video recording device. How many of you have a video capable phone or device in your pockets? Right, most of you do. So in fact, if I were showing private information here in this talk, and you, you could just hold up your phone and you could record this session, and that information is already in the public. And the same thing's true in any class where I teach or the scientific meetings. Once it's been shown in a, outside of a laboratory setting, it's in the public, and any guarantees otherwise are, are very difficult, if not impossible, to maintain. So that's why we made that simple distinction, no sharing, sharing, sharing plus excerpts that it, it, to us it conveys the, the, the risk in a, in a clear way. And at the same time, we have confidence based on our, our experience with video release forms that many participants will agree to uh, sharing plus excerpts so that we're not, we're not talking about a small fraction. Certainly not 100%, but a significant number. So in order for this to work, we have to build a user community. That means that our colleagues need to become authorized investigators. We need, uh, they need to, uh, we need to design a registration process. We have an investigator agreement uh, that I will be talking about just here shortly, which covers data contributions, uh, these non-research or research uses. And we are also uh, have been encouraged to work closely with our institutions, as David mentioned, to get institutional sign-off on this process so that so that uh, sponsored projects offices at Penn State, um, the legal office is reviewing it, as is the risk management uh, office. Uh, we want to cover all of our bases to make sure that uh, investigators who might be participating in Databrary uh, are known to their institutions um, and that, that there's a, a level of mutual trust. So with respect to this uh, investigator agreement where research uh, conduct is concerned, what we've essentially done on the other side is create a document, an institutional agreement, we're now calling it a data use contribution agreement, that essentially describes who does what at different stages and for different levels of use. So whether it's access to data, what the responsibilities of the investigator are, which is applying for training, um, what the institution's responsibilities are, what database responsibilities are, um, and uh, what these components are. I just sort of point out that Databrary's main contribution is to maintain the sharing permissions that have been provided to us by the uh, investigators. Where browsing or viewing data is concerned, everyone has to maintain uh, privacy of the data. Um, Databrary and the institution, well, Databrary will be keeping information about data, who's accessing what kinds of data. We may share those with institutions. Um, and importantly, uh, based upon advice from some of our advisors who have been pioneers in uh, data archiving, we've been encouraged to ask institutions to take responsibility in the event that there are ethics breaches. So our institutions will be uh, promising to treat violations of Databrary policies as research ethics violations uh, at their home institution and, and take that responsibility on. So, 
sometimes informally among the group, we talk about extending a web of trust, uh, which, exi which currently exists between an investigator and research participants. And we're extending that web uh, or that network to include Databrary and an associated set of investigators who have uh, agreed to certain ethical principles and agreed to abide by them uh, with the permission of their institutions. So this project is uh, an open source project from the, the get-go. It has been since before we even um, got the grants for Databrary. Our, our video coding tool, which we will not mention, is free and open source, and you can find it here. Um, but all of our policy documents are available at Databrary, uh, the GitHub site, and also on our website. We welcome your thoughts or contributions or suggestions. That's how this thing builds. And um, that includes not the, only the, the two documents that I talked about, but uh, term definitions, our philosophy about data sharing, um, and investigator rights, and so forth, and best practices. So now I'm going to uh, turn the presentation over to Dylan, who will talk about the uh, data model for the kinds of diverse data sets we expect to be curating. Um, so before I start, I just want to uh, say that in, in building a data model for Databrary, we really wanted to start with a very simple, lightweight uh, model that would uh, be enough to represent the kinds of data that researchers have, uh, and also to allow discovery. Um, and so, obviously, a big part of this website will be finding, allowing researchers to find videos that will be useful for them, and, and um, so that's really where we're starting here. At the same time, we need to realize that um, we don't want to impose any strict ontology on the kinds of data that people have. And also, there is, as far as we know, nothing in the field that researchers are actually following in terms of um, standardizations for storing their data or for representing it. In fact, lots of people are, are still using pen and paper for a lot of this data. Uh, so when we started, we, we started thinking about this concept of study. And this is a very common concept within within researchers in terms of, of, of representing um, a, a particular research enterprise within uh, a lab. Um, but as we followed along with this, we realized that actually different people mean different things by the word study. For some people, it could be a single statistical analysis. For some people, it could be a multi-year project that could actually generate many research papers. Um, the other problem we found is, in fact, the definition of a study can change over time. So if we decide, okay, this, this package of data is going to represent a study, uh, the researcher could later decide, actually, I want to split this into two studies or add more data to this study. And so we need to, so this study concept has to be very flexible. Instead, we, start, we focus uh, at, uh, at the beginning on uh, the raw data themselves. So, so within uh, what we call a session, a participant often comes into a lab, you have a video recording, that video recording is going to stay pretty much as it is uh, for the lifetime. And then you can do further kinds of analysis and research on this video, but the video is really what's important for us. Um, and so this, raise, this creates this concept that we're calling session. And a session is simply a period of time in which you've collected some amount of data. It's usually a single video, but it could be multiple videos collected at the same time or overlapping. There could be other kinds of data that you've acquired, uh, audio data, EEG, any, any raw data that was generated in that session will go into this concept of a session. Um, so for us, a session is really defined by the, the date, the, the exact time at which that, se that session data were, those session data were collected. And also, uh, very importantly, as Rick mentioned, the release level that, the, at, that all of the participants have agreed to. Um, and that covers, that will affect the permissions applied to the study. Uh, it also, ha of course, will have uh, all of the files um, and other kinds of metadata, which I'll talk about soon. Um, so this is probably pretty straightforward for, you, for an audience like this. But uh, to sort of represent this to our users, we say a session is kind of like a folder. And you can think of this as, as having a timeline. You can add your video files and specify where in time they were they were taken, uh, if you have overlapping files, if you do um, other kinds of data collection, you might have a document uh, that you scan in. Uh, you can add that to this container. And then these last two rows on the bottom are different uh, analyses you might later 
go back and add. So you can do uh, what's called the coding pass of a video, and that specifies some sort of quantitative analysis of this video and add that back um, on top of this session later. Um, so for each file in a session, uh, we store pretty basic straightforward stuff, just a name and description. And this is just something for the researcher to identify how this is, how this is different from any other files that might be in the session. Uh, of course, we keep track of file formats. Um, and for now, we're only allowing uh, particular sets of, uh, particular types of files that, that we understand. Um, and in the case of video or the time series data, we also uh, store, of course, the length of the video and the position in time, as you saw on the previous uh, slide. Um, and most importantly, for every file, we also need to know whether it, it contains identifiable information. So videos with faces do contain identifiable information, whereas um, something uh, like motion tracking information is not necessarily identifiable. Or even a video that just includes somebody's hands is not counted as identifiable in terms of HIPAA requirements. Um, and so that then also affects uh, the permissions that were uh, on this file. Uh, so once you have a set of sessions, uh, we can collect them into a data set. And often people are, are uh, collecting uh, the same kind of data from different participants. The different people visit the lab, they do the same thing. Um, and so you collect all of those sessions into a single data set. Um, but of course, the next very important thing is how do you actually organize the sessions? You, there's various kinds of metadata associated with these, set, these sessions that are very important. Um, but the data set as a whole first uh, is associated with uh, various types of descriptions that, that, that are common across all of these sessions. Um, so we ask researchers for a title and a short description of the data set. Uh, we ask them for to specify and maintain permissions on this data set, so users and groups of users who should have access, whether or not they wish at this point to share it with Databerry, and of course these are all things they can change at any point. Uh, we also require them to spe expli explicitly specify and select excerpts if excerpts are allowed, uh, because we need to know which sections of video actually ha can, can potentially be released to the public. Uh, also, other kinds of documents, files that just describe the procedures, uh, blank forms they used, anything like that. Um, and various other information that could be interesting to researchers. Um, and also, then, we ask them to specify metadata on the sessions. And uh, so to do this, we've come up with a kind of annotation scheme on, on the sessions. And for, for users, we describe these as groups. So you can, you can apply annotations or equivalently put your sessions into groups. Um, and these, these groups could represent various different things. They can represent a single participant. They could represent a condition if you, if you do have different kinds of procedures with different subjects. Um, if you have people come back for different visits, you, they could represent that. Um, and, and of course, as, as an annotation system, uh, if each, each session can be applied, can be placed in arbitrarily many groups, and um, all of these groups are contained within that data set. Uh, so for example, in the case of a, a group representing a participant, uh, uh, we ask for, very, for um, particular kinds of information that are, that are uh, uh, relevant to researchers. And, and this is actually what we think is most, uh, and what we found from talking to people is actually the most important pieces of information. So, for a participant, we ask them for a participant ID. Usually people just have unique IDs that they generate themselves, usually just numbers. Uh, we ask for birth date, gender, and race ethnicity. Those are sort of the most important three things. Um, and once we have the birth date here, and of course we have the session date in the session, we can calculate ages. And ages for researchers are, are one of the very important things that, that inform their research. Um, we, can we ask for various other things. All of these things, of course, are optional. and uh, and in fact, this is a very generic kind of measurement system. You can add your own measurements. Uh, so if you have other kinds of pieces of information that you collect and you want to store it with your sessions, you can add those on. Um, and this is sort of our, our way of, of, while not enforcing any ontology, allowing people to create their own. So if somebody uh, adds a measure to a particular participant or to some other kind of, of grouping, a condition or something like that, other researchers will see that this is now available to them and they can reuse this measurement. Uh, 
So just to, to make this very concrete, and this should be pretty straightforward, you can add, if you have all these sessions, you can group them by participant to say which participants were in each of these sessions. Um, you could also add a grouping for visits if it's actually important which day they came or something like that. Um, and, and so for example, this, this might represent something like a longitudinal study where people come back every year um, and you maybe have a partial data set like this. Um, and the thing that this, this allows us to do, th having this, this general grouping system, uh, is be very flexible in terms of, of representing and both import and export of data. Um, and so what we found is people often organize their data already in a folder structure that kind of represents these groups. But people have different folder structures depending on what they're thinking about. Some people uh, might think the participants are actually the most important thing and have participants as their top level folders by subject ID and then have separate vis visits inside those. Other people actually might focus on visits um, in the longitudinal studies, say year one, year two, year three. And so in this case, we can uh, allow people to export their data in either of these forms, depending on, on what they want, uh, or uh, equivalently import it. Um, so I started talking about studies. Um, and, and studies we see are sort of now this layer that you can place on top of data sets. Data sets provide a very uh, good organization for what people are doing in their own labs to keep track of data as they're collecting it, to keep track of analyses they're doing. But often they want to present their data to other researchers in a very different way. Um, and so studies are sort of a, a, a data reuse mechanism in which uh, you can, in a, within a study, say, I'm going to use these sessions from this data set and these sessions from this other data set in, in any flexible way. Here, the, here, this is how I want to represent them. And that will be the face of your research data to the world. And we found that this is a very important thing to, to make researchers feel comfortable about, about uh, how, how their data actually look. Um, and so, so once, along with pulling in these sessions to a study, you can also then add other kinds of analyses you do. That was the thing I was talking about in terms of layering coding. Um, other kinds of, of aggregate analysis you do within the session. Um, and so just uh, as, for example, the diagram, you have all these data sets. Um, and in particular, these data sets do not necessarily need to come from the same researcher. People can aggregate across different data sets from different labs, from different locations, um, and pull these into a study, represent how all of the raw data that went into this study represent the products of, of this study, represent pit, associate that study with uh, published papers, journal articles, presentations they've done, anything like that. Uh, so just to talk a little bit about our ingest process, um, the ingest process really starts by talking to a researcher, uh, talking to a contributor, and asking them to identify data that they they want to contribute and that they can contribute if they have the appropriate uh, release forms. Uh, and then it's up to them to sort of determine how to group their, their files into uh, data sets and studies, um, and also to verify that they have all the correct permission information. Um, so we ask them to start by doing those things and also providing all of the top level information associated with the study, um, description, publications, things like that. Um, and of course, all of these things are things that they can change at later times. Once we have all this information, right now we're in a very manual uh, data curation mode. So we collect information, spreadsheets, things like that, all of the files that, they, that we have. We try to organize these into flat files representing um, uh, the list of all the sessions, the list of all the participants, any other kinds of groupings they have. Um, right now we're just using simple CSV to import things into the database. Um, and also, of course, we want to collect all of the raw data themselves, the videos, and we try to get um, as close to the original video, as high quality as possible. Often this is not possible. People transcode them and remove the originals very early in their process or do some kind of processing. But we try to get as close to the original. Um, then we, we transcode videos into a standard format. We're using H.264, um, so we specified a format that um, is appropriate for our needs. In particular, this is useful for us because it allows uh, streaming via HTML5 video, which, which lets people get very uh, direct, immediate access to the data. Um, 
And right now, a lot of these processes are fairly manual, but we're working to automate these more and more. Um, and and I, that's actually, um, actually before I, sort of a big part of what, what we're focusing on right now is starting to move many of these processes from a, a very manual curation mode to more sort of self-curation where users can do these, pro do these uh, things themselves and review their own data. Um, and yeah, this is obviously a hard thing. <laughs> Uh, just to, uh, we have to have a system architecture diagram, uh, but basically we have a, a simple SQL database representing things I've already talked about, um, and then store files um, on NFS file system. Um, we have a replica site, um, and we have a web front end on top of all these things. People have specific questions about that, I'm happy to talk about it too. But. Um, things we're planning for 1.0, uh, which will be uh, early next year, as David said, is um, uh, of course in, uh, st appropriate study views, and this is a big sort of refining this process to make studies look the way researchers like them. Um, implementing search and discovery features, um, starting to do a lot more of the policy-driven uh, automating a user authentication, things like that. Um, and of self curation features, talk, talked about most of this stuff. Um, and overall, of course, um, we know that our goal is really we want to build a community. Um, and, and that's really about doing three things at once. We know we need to get more interesting data, and that's one of the things we're focusing on right now. We're going to high value data sets, um, doing a very manual careful uh, curation process on, on these data sets which have, which have not necessarily before um, even been digitized in many cases. Um, and these are data sets that our, our users potentially will be interested in. Um, that, of course, um, will attract more users which will allow more, attract more people to actually contribute their data and um, hopefully we will be able to grow our community in this way. Um, so yeah, this, just to summarize our aims again, we've talked about we talked really about um, Databerry as a, a video sharing platform um, and about, we talked about policies. Um, um, but if you have questions about any of that or, or other aims. Thank you all.